writers, you're listening to the Kobo Writing Life Podcast, where we bring you insights and inspiration for growing your self-publishing business, coming to you from Kobo's headquarters in Toronto. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Kobo Writing Life Podcast. I'm Stephanie. And I'm Chrissy. And in this episode, we interviewed an author live and in person. Sarah Winman came into Kobo headquarters a few weeks ago and I had the opportunity to actually interview her in the Kobo Cafe, which to locate you, it's a little room in the back of the office here, you know. It's an intimate space. Yeah. Everyone's all close together. Yeah, we call it a fireside chat. We often put a little fire video (laughs) behind us to really set the mood. Set the tone, get it right. Coffee, snacks, and an author and our Kobo employees love it. It's a pretty cool perk we get to have authors come in here and chat with us. So just close your eyes and imagine you're sitting with us in the Kobo Cafe. The fire is crackling, the heat yeah. It's cozy. It's cozy. And I was talking to Sarah, who wrote a book called Tin Man, which is traditionally published. And I really enjoyed reading it. It was very literary about a trio of friends living in the UK. And we're from the perspective of one friend who's reliving the memories of his relationships with his best friend and his wife. A lot of tragedy happens along the way, so it's certainly not a feel-good read. Spoiler. (laughs) Yeah, spoiler alert. A really interesting one, and I loved hearing all of the the interesting backstory. Obviously, anytime you get to hear that from an author, I love hearing you know, why the story was written. It actually took her 10 years to write this book, so you'll find out why and um, what the final thing was all about and what the title of the book, Tin Man, is all about. Ooh. Yeah. Intrigue. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. My mm. pleasure. <laughs> so you all know me. I am Chrissy Monroe, and this is our guest for today, Sarah Winman. Welcome. Yes. Thank you. coming up. This is your lunch hour, isn't it? Oh, it's really impressive. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. You grew up in Essex and now live in London, England, not Ontario. Yeah. <laughs> Attended the Weber Douglas Academy of Dramatic Art and went <coughs> to act in theater, film, and television. And Tin Man is your third novel. Yep. Yeah. So... I'll just jump right into it because I know you have a hard stop at 2.45 and I want to leave some questions for the the crowd if they have any for you. Okay. So I'll give some background on the book for anybody who hasn't gotten to read it yet, but I do highly recommend it. Um, So the book opens in Oxford, England in the 1950s. It's a really interesting opening scene. We jump right into marital conflict between Dora and Leonard. She wins this local raffle, and there's option of two prizes, a bottle of whiskey or a reproduction of Van Gogh's Sunflowers painting, and the whole crowd is local men chanting whiskey. And she goes for the Sunflowers painting, yep. and her husband is outraged. <laughs> but she um, hangs the painting on the wall and threatens him like a death threat with a hammer. Yeah, and then she yeah. says, you know, and tomorrow you'll buy a new hammer because this hammer's staying with me. <laughs> but I think it's, it's very much of, of what the time. I think mm. the reason I do the start of a book kind of is the last thing I write. The first thing I write is the ending, which does make sense, actually, in a kind of a redemptive novel, that if you know what the ending is, then the beginning will probably be the opposite. And so mm. um, with that... When I went back in 1950, it's very important to know that this man would have gone to war and was probably only come back mm. for three years. And there, in England and Wales, we had a spike in marriages in 1940, as you'd expect, before people went off to war. And then what people don't know that I learned was that there was a spike in domestic violence in 1947, which makes perfect sense mm-hmm. of some men returning, strangers immense freedom I think one of there was a great sexual freedom for women and men during that time and then they went back into the sort of 1950s um, straight jacketed world of what that was and this is it he's, he's come back and he's damaged and the other thing is that that of this period of time uh, of, of this place we're looking at it as a very conservative working class area dominated by a car factory and that was your destiny and my grandparents worked there and my grandfather especially, was undereducated. Mm. And one of the conflicts of this scene is that this woman who recognised this painting when she was at school and she thought it had opened up her life 
and that it opened up her heart, the possibilities of travel and beauty, all of these things from this very grey working class area gave her hope that he is frightened by that. He's uneducated to the point that when difference enters his life and he doesn't know what he's supposed to, how he's supposed to respond to a piece of art, he gets very frightened. And men of that time, their fear became anger. And so that's what it's about. The conflict mm. really becomes almost like a conflict of the book, that to bring art into an area whereby your destiny is to go over there and work, who will you need to champion you mm -hmm. in order to break free of, of the constraints of birth? That's so interesting. And I guess we could just jump into another thing that I'm, I was really curious about because, well, first of all, you highlight there that a lot is left unsaid. I have the large print version of this book, but it's actually quite small. It's maybe 200 pages in yeah. regular size. Um, and all of that is completely unsaid. And there's a lot of things that, if you just read the surface, it is almost simple, but it's, you know, you get breaking down into di layers underneath yeah. all of these characters and the time and the time period. So the book is not linear. You start with the scene, and then you go to a car accident much later, and then back to when the, our two main characters, which is two 12-year-old boys, mm. are now in the 1960s. Mm. Um, why did you make the book so... Narratively complex. <laughs> well, I didn't intend to. Mm -hmm. I think um, we don't remember in a linear way. It's as simple as that. And so, although the foreshadowing of the novel is 1950, to bring context, uh, the now of the story, because it's in two parts, and Ellis's story is the opener, is 1996. Mm -hmm. And that is really the now of the story. It's just the fact that, that his memories of that period of time, uh, memories go back. You know, you, you walk the streets of when you were a child and you remember that. It's really simple. You, that's it. Yeah. And then when we get to Michael's story, which is in the second part of the book, it's 1989. And so it, it's not as complex as people sometimes like to make out. You know, I have anchored them in a period of time, which is very important. 96 was very important for Ellis because actually the car factories changed after that. The whole structure changed. We also had a really good government in 97 and that would have made it a little bit too hopeful and also 96 <laughs> after that was when um, anti-retrovirals came in so there was a reason for, for sort of making it 96 and 89 of course for um, what I call the estrangement years of uh, Ellis and Michael 89 was, was when um, the story of AIDS was really uh, you know very virulent we're moving into a very bleak time with that so that's really what I wanted. So mm -hmm. that's how I anchored the time frame. And the rest was really, as I said, about this man. You know, he, he is one of three. So the story, for those who don't know, it's about Ellis and Annie and Michael. And Ellis and Annie were married very successfully. Um, it's about best friendship between Michael and Ellis that it started in, in childhood and went through to adulthood. And then the story really is about um, the sexual relationship they had as boys and young men and this brief nine-day holiday that they had in France that is like the golden time. And then when we start the story in 96, only Ellis is alive. And so the whole idea of memory, of course it is. If you are still living in the city where the two people have loved you and defined you the most, that's going to be your memory. Everything has memory. And so... We go back and forward with that. But as in life, you mentioned it's a small book. Mm -hmm. We don't, we don't, you know, we, we have an age range here. I don't know if people are probably in their late teens, maybe early 20s, going through, if I say me, uh, mid 50s. We don't have that, we don't have 50 years of memory. We just can't. You don't probably have 20 years of memory. What we remember is they're quite specific. And they are the specifics that somehow we have anchored to make them de those memories define who we are. And that's all I've kind of done with this book, that I've given you enough to define who these people were, mm -hmm. and then you can just probably add the rest. So really getting into those three main characters and what that relationship is, the boys slowly fall in love, and they have quite different childhoods. So Ellis is the son of that, that couple that we see fighting at the beginning, and Michael is an orphan who is then raised by his grandmother, Mabel. Mm. And so you have these two nurturing females. Dora eventually dies. 
and Mabel really tries to foster this art interest that they both have, whereas Ellis doesn't really have that opportunity through his father Mm -hmm. and then rebels against that and tries to get, you know, the opportunity that Michael is having through his grandmother to explore that side of himself until his dad says, like, no, no more. You are going to the factory. This is the life for you. Mm -hmm. And then later we discover that um, Michael becomes gay and Ellis marries Annie. Michael was always gay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, no. I mean, that's that's the point. And, you know, I was just talking before about, you know, people often ask me whether Ellis is. It's kind of irrelevant. Yeah. Where they were at that point in time was real. Right. So yes, so these incredible women who yeah. are wanting to encourage these men to be who they are. Right. And it is. And then we add Annie into the story. So the women actually, even though this is a story told from the perspective of two men, it is a women's story as well. They yeah. are the most important characters. And I always say that it's, it's the three stages of womanhood. So we have the older woman, we have a sort of woman in middle age of that period of time, and then we have Annie as the young woman. And what they are invested in is allowing boys and these young men and these men to be who they are without that sort of enforced um, sort of almost gender role of what society required very much at the time of the 50s, 60s, 70s and even though we talk about that they they want them to enter, you know, they're artistic so why shouldn't they go into the arts and that's what they're encouraging. I would then say that the, the leap of this artistry is about vulnerability. Mm. The men that all these wi- women have witnessed in their lives and have not had the opportunity to be vulnerable. And therefore, you know, they've behaved in a certain way. And I often refer back to, I think it was Bell Hooks who said that the first act of violence that men commit is on themselves in um, stifling their emotional life. The second act is on women. And this is the kind of correlation that if mm-hmm. we can these women will instinctively know that if we can keep these young men or these men vulnerable or, or capable of beautiful things or living that, maybe they won't fall back on the behaviours that have preceded them in their family, which is really important, and these women see that. And kind of Michael does get away with that because he's, he's sort of brought up with his, by his grandmother, who is wonderful. And Ellis almost does. Right. You know, he almost is there. Because what we need, you can't do it alone. You can't break free and be different without someone. I've never actually seen that in right. life. Whether it's, you know, I don't know, to do, take a different path in life or, um, you know, certainly in my time, you know, somebody mentoring you or, or uh, you know, supporting you when you're coming out. Everybody needs at least one person. And, of course, Ellis has that with his mum. And then he doesn't. Yeah. And his champion goes... And his father, through his own fear of not recognising this aspect of masculinity, because it is an aspect of masculinity, he doesn't recognise it. It's just his son is different. And he's very scared that his son, not that he's ever mentioned, he's very scared that his son will be gay. Yeah, that's exactly where I was going with the question. Yes. Is it that Ellis never has the opportunity to explore how vulnerable he could possibly be? Not necessarily defining that as gay. No, but but that's it. His shame predates his sexuality. Yeah. His shame is about being vulnerable and being able to love as himself because his father has pretty much knocked that out. So the sexuality, in Ellis's case, is part of it. But Michael says, I have known a long time that I was not the key to unlock him she would come later. Mm. And so he always knew that, you know. Yeah. Um, that does not mean that their relationship was any less. And I think this is also what I like to explore, is that a successful relationship is not le- necessarily longevity. It's about the right person coming into your, t- your life at the right time and allowing you to be who you are. And yeah. so Ellis and Michael had a very successful time for, what, for how long it was. Even if it was just those nine days in France, they found aspects of themselves and um, became better versions of themselves because of that. Yeah. And that, in no sense, encroaches on the marriage of Ellis and Annie because that also was incredibly successful. Yeah. And those two relationships sit side by side and um, do not diminish one or the other at all. Sure. I wanted to hear your thoughts on what the title means to you, to 
Tin Man. What does it mean to you? <laughs> well, <laughs> Wizard of Oz? No. Okay. I think that's way too simple. Okay. Because there's, there's nobody who doesn't have a heart, if that's how narrow you're going to get yeah. with what that could possibly mean in the book. Yeah. Um, you could maybe say the dad, but that's still too simple for that character. Mm. Um, potentially the car factory and whatever yeah. heart lives in the men that work there. Would be my Tin Man, the title, is totally literal. The Tin Man, the Tinny, is a job in a car factory. Yes. It is, a, <laughs> it is as simple as that. You know, they, they exist and they're called Tinnies. And I got to know this about 20 years ago. As I said, my grandfather worked in a car factory, so it was always part of my life. But it was only when I found out that this job existed. And the job, for those of you who don't know, um, is a highly specialised panel beater. So if we go back to when we actually manufactured cars... Uh, say in the 60s or 70s when I'm writing about this so you had the assembly line and it was, it's, it's massive and the starting point would be sort of body in white where you know fre- uh, freshly sort of pressed panels would come off uh, out of the factory over there because there were two factories in Oxford at that point one was Press Steel and one was Morris's the car uh, factory and they fed each other so it was great you know, you, you built this car it was soldered and it was noisy and it was grey and if there was a dint because they were coming from over there. There was always a blemish of some sort. The guy, it would move into the tinny bay, and these guys, you know, there wasn't too much finesse at this point. They were hammering it out, and I've seen these tools, and they're handmade tools, designed specifically to work here. And it became, there was more finesse as you went along. And then by the time you got right at the far end, in the paint shop, you were dealing with cars that were pretty much ready to go on the road. So they were painted, they were polished, the wheels were on, Right. Now, if you found a dent or something, again, they would take them to the tinny bay. And at this point, you've got the guys who've been there for years, and they know how to work this. They know how to get a dent out, often without damaging the paintwork. And they put on white gloves. And then they start to just feel. And that's Mm. how they find these moments and these inconsistencies. And I met one, Ernie I met uh, when I was researching. And I came in and saying, oh my God, what a job, you know, because by then I'm thinking, this is almost like being a sculptor in a very industrial environment. Mm. Of course, he thought I was nuts because actually he was a factory worker and had been for life. And he couldn't describe what he did until he started to move his hands. Or we would draw things. I'd say, tell me, I can't work out what a dolly is. And then he would... He would work it, we drew things, and I got a rough idea. I mean, I still really don't know precisely what they do, because, because it's counterintuitive. They somehow get behind a dent, and they knock it out from behind. So there's a pinging sort of thing that happens. But it's this, and they locate the dent, and, and whether they, they, they sort of got it right through sound. So to me, it's like, oh my goodness. This is, on so many levels, mm. this works brilliantly. So the key was to find this job because one of the things that I, was, that I really... is important with characters is to give them dignity in whatever that's going to be. So Ellis, although we know he has a talent for the arts, and it would be wonderful if he could enter that environment, it's very unrealistic for many people because they don't have that champion. And so I didn't want his life to be ruined Mm -hmm. just because he can't go and do what he thought he was going to do because, again, we all take different paths to get to where we are. And so when I knew this job, I thought, okay, he can have a good life if he does this. He can have... There there will be... He can be fulfilled doing this job because he has has sort of the mind of the arts. You know, he, he works in line and he works in in beauty really so suddenly he has something mm-hmm. over there so that's where it comes from okay of course you can't name a book that yeah and not <laughs> at least think is there an association with the wizard of oz because people will expect it and as i said it's not about the tin man however what it is about what i did like in the wizard of oz was the yellow brick road and the idea of journeying towards self-realisation and truth of some sort. And the circular idea of that, of travelling and then saying, there's no place like home. 
the start of the book, there is a quote by Van Gogh who says, it has done me good to go south, the better to see the north. So you understand what I'm getting at here. So if we just park that idea, so yellow, Mm -hmm. brick road, (coughs) and journey. So I have been to a place in France called Arles. Many times I go for the uh, Rencontre, which is a a photography uh, festival. It runs throughout the summer, and the the beginning in July is, is quite magical. So I had been there many times, and I knew that Van Gogh, this was his destination, and it was his destination in the South. And he wanted to go there um, to set up an artist studio with Paul Gauguin. This I knew. I wasn't interested in the painting of sunflowers. Uh, it, didn't, it wasn't my favourite of his at all. Right. But when I was down there one year, I read a book called Dear Theo. And it's an incredible book if anyone is interested in the mind of probably one of the greatest artists of modern times. And it is the letters that he wrote to his brother, who financed his career, basically. And he is the most exquisite writer. That's all I can say. The way he articulates loss and longing and love and creativity, and how he sees his paintings before they went on canvas, and how he writes about colour. It is extraordinary. So he's saying, I want to go south. I've got to go south. It's going to make me a better artist. I want to follow the light. I want to follow the sun. And I'm thinking, ah, that's so interesting. Following the sun from north to south instead of Mm. the sun in the film and in life from east to west. So there is a pattern here. And then he writes a letter to his brother that he's waiting for Paul Gauguin to join him. And he's just completed a series of paintings of sunflowers that he is going to use to decorate Paul Gauguin's room. Mm. And suddenly I had the context of why this was an extraordinary painting. But it was also it it was also leading to what Dora said about men and boys being capable of beautiful things. The gesture for her would have been like seeing a man maybe going out into the field and picking flowers and putting them in his room. It's a sign of welcome. And so the anatomy of of a book is all of those things. So we have journeying, and we have yellow, and we have going north to south instead of east to west, and we have the colour yellow, and then we have sunflowers. And that's sort of how stories come Mm -hmm. together. And so that that was the association with with that film. I can accept that explanation. (laughs) (laughs) And that's really beautiful. There's that line in the opening scene where the painting will give light to their silent dinners. Yeah. which is just a, such a brutal image, but also beautiful in the context of her knowing Dora like, gives herself that love with the painting by putting it on the wall. It is, and it's, and it's, and it's a window for mm-hmm. her, and she's never going to go there. And um, I was talking a little bit earlier about this painting, that probably when Dora saw this painting when she was 15, it's very different to when she saw it later on. It's the way that we read books you know, the books we read in our 20s are very, have a very different centre than when we reread them in our 30s and our 40s. So she would have known, seen that painting. Strangely, how I remember that painting, that it's very yellow, and there are these, what is it, 13 heads of sunflowers that would be very vibrant. And actually, it's not that at all. This is not very yellow. This is sort of ochre. And this is... These are flowers that have actually passed. Many of them are now, you know, dying. The heads are drooping. And so it's a, it conjures up a very, very different image for her mm-hmm. of past opportunity, but her remembering her youth and what she wants for her son. Mm-hmm. And so it almost becomes like a religious icon that she sits there and looks at it, and it's about, it is about faith, but that being translated as acceptance, and that she does at this point have an acceptance of her life. Uh, mm. Um, I'd like to shift gears a little bit towards the, I guess, practical side of things um, with two questions. First, um, in the afterword, you said it wrote, it took you 10 years to write this book. Yeah. Um, What was so challenging or was it more of a, a life issue happening what what made this take so long <laughs> i know considering it's so small yes right? yes <laughs> but there's a lot packed in there and a lot that obviously went into the thought process yeah. behind it before the words were there because there were two books that's it two mm. books called tin man 
So, the first book came out of, if we go back to 2005, 2006, I uh, had no intention of writing a novel. That wasn't what I was going to do. I was uh, an actor at that point, mm-hmm. and probably the only thing that I could see about writing was maybe writing a film script, which I had done. But film scripts or plays that I had written would be made, and there would be a part for me, which is generally um, what actors do. Yeah. Your friends, if you have actor friends, many of you will be writing scripts. And I hope it does work out for them. It didn't for me. <laughs> but I wanted to do something. You know, I, I was stuck. I felt unemployable. I wasn't acting anymore. I was really in stasis. I, I, I was a bit frightened. And so I needed to do something different. I explored whether I was going to go and do open university, something. You know, what was it? In the meantime, I went to do this adult education course which was called Exploring Fiction and it was very gentle and it was, wasn't um, creative writing mm-hmm. it was just looking at, at text which was lovely and I, I loved the teacher and at, ev- at the end of each class she would say oh you know if you want to do this exercise you can do it and then you can read your stuff at the end of next week and um, I was like yeah that sounds fun some of us did it some of us didn't and I did two terms and at the end of the two terms, I had 40,000 words of a book called Tin Man, set in Oxford, around the car factory, with a central story of a little bit of art mm-hmm. or, or artistic talent being, you know, how does it break free of this world? And it was my first book, and I had no idea what I was doing. But I, sent, I gave these words to... Because um, it surprised me. It's like, mm. why am I writing this? I, you know, I thought to write a novel, you needed to go to university and you needed to at least have a pretty good education in English, of which I had neither. Um, and I didn't actually understand the value of the storytelling that I was involved in, which was, you know, at that point, 25 years on stage and oral storytelling. So I gave it to my uh, agent at the time, who was affiliated with... Um, a literary agency two days later I got a call from an agent he said I want another 25,000 words I can promise you this book is going to sell I'm your agent he's still my agent Uh, the book didn't sell (laughs) and it it was right I've learned a little bit more Mm. about books now and it was a really quiet novel and and people at the time said it's not a first book Um, and I thought that was strange at the time and I do understand that now so he was clever he, when Rabbit sold, it gave me a little bit of leverage. And when the publisher wanted a new book, uh, he said, yeah, 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 she'll write a new book, but you've got to take her first book, which they didn't want. But that was what I was contracted to do, and it's like, oh, I'll just edit it, that'll be fine. Nine years passed before <laughs> I looked at this book again, which would have been in November 2015, and I was to deliver it in July 2016. And I was like, oh, my God. I've told some of this book in Rabbit and I've told some of this book in Marvelous and you can imagine in Marvelous because the central character is an old woman and the way old women play uh, between those two books Mm. I also didn't write like that anymore you know the whole idea of 10,000 hours I'd done that probably twice over I was I was better than I was not only was I better than putting it on the page that I was just better at working out how stories are told and I was starting to get an idea of how I wanted to tell stories so I tried to do old and new, and that didn't work. And then it was really quite good because it was like, well, what story haven't I actually told? And it was the real the story of three people, but primarily two people, and the relationship between these two men. Mm. And so I knew it would be that, and I wrote it very quickly. And I knew it would be small, and I wanted to write a small story because I don't write short stories. I don't really like reading short stories. And, but I wanted to write short form to show that I understood that sort of mm-hmm. the idea of imprint and the idea of absence. And I also really wanted to. I loved the book on Chesil Beach, which is a small novel. And you read this novel, and you're going along, and he's he's witty and he's fantastic, and you know it's a really character driven, and it's you know, you know it's full of longing and the the great what if. Mm-hmm. But it's also what I call an ending heavy novel. So you go along, and I had one friend who thought, is this a good book or is it just a a book as you're going along? (laughs) You know, sort of, oh, okay, is it? And then you get 
the moments of the empty chair in the theatre. And it's devastating. Yeah. And I thought, oh, I'd like to make, I'd like to do something like that. That you go along and then you realise what it was all about, really, at the end. Yeah. And so that really sort of That's drove me towards that. Okay. That fills it in and makes a lot of sense. I think it too. <laughs> but it's a beautiful journey of the book to land where it is now at the time in your career that seems to make a lot of sense <laughs> as yeah, a third I, book as well. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think, yeah. it, I think it worked out well. Yeah. Um, I, I was surprised. I don't, I, I, I don't feel greatly connected to the book mm. in a way that I might have done with the previous book because it was... I wrote it quite quickly, and, and as I say, the first part of the book, I call it being off the page, that I didn't feel very connected to Ellis because he's not connected to anyone. Mm -hmm. And that was quite interesting, sort of writing in that way. Yeah. But I've, I've become more connected to it when I sort of talk to people or <laughs> they ask me questions about it. Yeah. Um, last question from me, and then maybe we'll have time for a question or two from um, these guys. So... You narrated your own audiobooks for all three of your books. Yep. Um, what was that experience like, and was that your decision or your publisher's yeah, no, suggestion? It, well, it was my publisher's suggestion, but if we go back to Rabbit, remember, I've just come out of not working much as an actor and probably not getting 90% of my auditions. So I thought it was a shoe in <laughs> when I was going to do the audiobook for Rabbit. And I go and I sit in there, and this bloke, Dave, He's like, yeah, well, we'll see. We're, you know, we'll see if you're good enough to do it. Like, <laughs> but it was good because yeah. I, it freed me up in a way because I never knew the connection between really storytelling as an actor and storytelling writing. I, you know, most of this was all instinctive and I, and I hadn't had time to think about it. Mm. So I just thought I was going to read Rabbit straight. And then Dave was really big on accents and playing around and actually, I had great fun with it. Yeah. And I thought, oh, yeah, you know what? This is it. And, it. and it made going and doing events with Rabbit much easier because reading, I could have so much fun. And then again, when I did Marvelous, I could... I loved her voice, and I always had her voice. And I read it in her voice, which, um, which I loved. And then it was, it was quite easy. When I came to hear it, then I did read it straight because, you know, that was that was right for the book and also I don't know if any of you know an Oxford accent it's really hard <laughs> it's got a slight slight burr sort of at the end but it's really hard to nail and if you get it too much it can sort of almost be comedic so I, I kind of read it in a straight yeah. probably would have been a London accent and played around with class with sort of maybe more of a, a straight a, a really sort of a working London accent so interesting um, I haven't had a chance to listen to this one yet performed by you as an audiobook, but I really want to dive into it again. I feel like it's the kind of book you have to read two or three times. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so questions from this group? The thing that, that I was stewing on, puzzling on, the whole time that I read this, and even afterwards, was the relationship between Michael and Annie. Um, mm -hmm. And that Michael so easily, or it seemed easily, um, care for her and wasn't jealous mm. even though by all accounts on the surface he should have been mm. and whether or not that was obvious to you or if that was an intentional choice or... if I go back to the previous book they, they had different names but there was this sort of three character, there was more jealousy in there, but you know I, I've read it I, I've written it a long time ago and then what, what, was re what I was realising is that often we lose touch with people through no great drama there's often, there's, there's times that you just move on. And in the same way, there doesn't have to be great drama. And so when it comes to Michael and, and Annie, no, he, he loves her, but he also knows that Annie is almost keeping him in his life and that they operate as a three. And Ellis and Michael have very different relationships with Annie. And they tell the story of Annie in very different ways, but not conflicting. And that was really important. Mm -hmm. That they, 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 you know, here's Michael's, here's Alice's, and it goes together, and we get the complete Annie. And Michael loves her. That's it. It's, it's family for him. And it's very interesting that, that in these great moments that he goes back to Annie. So when he finally goes back to Oxford, it's her, because the other is so hard and so difficult you know, that, that his connection, his actual connection to Ellis 
is Annie. And she's the conduit for everything. And I often say, because people say, so, you know, there is a crash, we know about it. But I know the story of that crash. And the story of that crash is that they went out and they did go to this event and they talked. That moment is because one of the juxta, or one of the moments really is, is about Michael's diagnosis and the loneliness. And um, he would have told her in the car. And that would have been really important for that ending, that, that it had been disclosed and that she would have said, we're here for you. And I think that's really, you know, that's really sort of important as a, as a backstory. Yeah. Do we have time for one more question? Yeah? Okay. One more question. Hey, I mean, I was going to ask you, like, unrelated um, to the book, but I'm right here, that's the best question. Did you like Loving Vincent? Did you watch that movie? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I thought it was done really, really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it, it brought in a sense of loneliness. Mm-hmm. Most people get to know Van Gogh because he cut his ear off and he's mad. Yeah. You know, that's the story, isn't it? And that has always been the story. Um, but there is something else going on, you know, and I, I think it touched on that sort of element of loneliness. Um, and this is a man who just wanted to be loved. You know, he loved his cousin, and it never sort of, those, those sort of moments didn't work out. But I loved, I mean, it's just the brilliance of what can be done now in filmmaking. Um, not only was each frame painted, but in each frame painted as if he had done it which I just thought was, was brilliant, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I did, loved it. No, I liked your explanation, because like, the cover is so striking, and then like, to hear why that particular painting um, mm-hmm. kind of like, leads so much to the story. But I think it is. I think sometimes we need context. And it's what I'm saying, is that, the, the, that our understanding, we are the only species that have... We, we, the understanding of so much in life comes at us... We have the be ability for, for metaphor, you know, I was talking before, and paradox. And so if we see a painting say, of two men. Okay, we see a painting of two men. But then if we see the, 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 the note next to it saying jealousy, we have a whole different understanding. And that, I think that's what's quite interesting. So for me, it will always be about um, a man who is suffering great illness and loneliness, so excited to wait for a friend to mm. come and visit him. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the question. We hope you enjoyed our interview with Sarah. And uh, we hope you imagined that fireplace crackling while you were listening. Yeah, or maybe you are in a place where you actually have a fireplace, and in which case I'm jealous of you leading into the holidays. Hopefully you have less snow than we do right now. In Toronto. Yep. We hope you really did like this episode. If you have ideas for episodes or authors or industry insiders you'd like us to speak to, email us. Yeah, let us know. Writinglife at Kobo.com. And um, no matter what you're doing over the holidays, we hope you stay safe and cozy and uh, grab some good podcasts or audio books to listen to. This book that you heard about today is available as an audio book, Tin Man. And Sarah narrated it herself wow. so i liked learning about that experience and um if you have your own audiobooks we'd love to hear about them as well so let us know and as always thank you for listening to the Copa writing life podcast we really appreciate it thank you For listening to the Kobo Writing Life podcast, where we provide insights and stories from leaders and experimenters in the world of self publishing. If you want even more information about growing your Kobo sales, check out our blog or find us on social. And if you're just finding us and ready to start your self publishing journey today, sign up for free at kobo.com/writinglife. Until next time, happy writing! <laughs>